The vibration of change, that magical place where life shifts from struggle to ease, from stagnation to forward movement, from old ways of being to new ways of becoming. Yes, it can seem rather elusive to get there, but when you are in it, you feel it down to your very core, and it can positively affect everything in your life, from your relationships to your health and well-being, from your career path to your abundance, from the quality of your inner connection to the fullness of your self-expression. Here on The Christine Uptrich Show, we explore ways to get into that vibration of change with experts in the fields of consciousness, psychology, spirituality, health, healing, and science. Are you ready to step into your vibration of change? Hello, everybody. Welcome. You might be listening live here on 1150 AM KKNW in the Seattle area, TransformationTalkRadio.com, Facebook Live on my professional page, or after the fact, on one of the dozens of podcasts that sends up or on my YouTube channel, but where and whenever you're joining us from today, you're going to be grateful you did because we're going to be talking about this concept of miracles. Do they just kind of happen or is there something we can do to truly help move them along? But before I introduce our wonderful guest today, I'd like to say hello to the people behind the technology, Mr. Benny Mathers at KKNW. Hi, Benny. Hi, Christine. How are you today? Doing awesome. I'm ready for more miracles, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Jacob at TTR. Hey, Christine. How are we doing today? Good, thanks. How's married life? Oh, so much fun. I feel like I'll never Oh, know. <laughs> that's great. That's great. You know, um, having worked in the, the healing realm for many, many years and having healed myself of cancer decades ago, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Um, our guest today is Dr. Mark Mincola. I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. I should have asked beforehand. Um, Perfectly well, did a great job. Great. <laughs> he's a nutritional therapist, a quantum energy healer. He has transformed the lives of more than 60,000 from around the world through his genius. He has integrated ancient Chinese energy healing techniques with cutting edge nutritional science and muscle testing for his own one of a kind approach to zero in, in on an individual's nutritional needs. He was awarded the 2021 Divine Contribution to Humanity Award, which was a big deal. And his new film, The Way of Miracles, was awarded Best Health Awareness Film of 2021. Boy, oh boy, do we need this right now. He has appeared all over the place on Dr. Oz, Better TV, ABC Talk Radio, on and on and on and on. And now we're so grateful to have him here on the Christine Uptrich Show. Um, I'd like to welcome Mark Mincola. Hi, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Beautiful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, you know, um, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I think that when we face a health crisis, we often go to this place of victimization. The, how did this happen to me? Why me? And I know that you've got your own journey that sort of led you to this, this place of um, sharing your wisdom with others. Can you tell us a little bit about what led you to having a passion for helping people to heal? Well, a number of years ago, when I was a young college student, I had an older brother. My brother was about 12 years older than I was. And my brother basically, at, at age 35, suffered a heart attack. And it was astounding to me. I mean, I, this was just such a jolt, such a shock. And I thought to myself, this can't be really happening. This is, this is unreal. And sure enough, I mean, he, he had elevated triglycerides, elevated cholesterol, elevated blood fats. His diet wasn't supportive of good health at all, cardiovascularly speaking. And I was like 20, 22 years old and I was basically a major, I was majoring in business at the time. And so my brother was in the hospital. And back in those days when they did open heart surgery, they did a really crude form of open heart surgery. They opened it up from under the chin to, the, to your toe. And they just opened them up like, like they opened them up like a chicken. And, and they, they, did, they, they did the work they needed to do. And I remember seeing my brother in the hospital with the, with the, the scar down his entire body. And I was just so shocked about this, this whole process. This just freaked me out completely. And I decided that I was going to study, learn as much as I could. I was going to hit as many reference libraries as I could hit. 
learn as much as I could about this and to find out how I could help my brother. And that inspired me to do that, to help him, to, to educate him, to, to inspire him, to teach him about food and, and the, the nutritional components of cardiovascular disease. At the time, there wasn't much out there, believe me, there wasn't very much at all. But I decided I was going to do my best to heal my brother. And I ended up making a difference. I mean, we, we ended up helping him. And over time, he improved his health. He worked out. He ate properly. And he, and he got better. Um, but I was just so, so moved by all this that I switched my major from business to nutrition. And everything in my life changed at that point. And from that day on, it's just been, there's been no looking back. I think that there are plenty of um, nutrition experts out there who focus on nutrition and only nutrition, the, the biochemical reaction within the body based on the food that, and we're gonna talk more about the importance of that, but you went a step beyond that. You, you have tied in the importance of dealing with the energetic system. Uh, why have you looked more, more towards the quantum realm to integrate the two? Well, for starters, when I was working with my brother, I, I went beyond the clinical component of his healing experience. I went, went into his body, into the body, mind, and spirit, the holism of, of life and his life and life in general. So I really focused on the, the, the things. My brother and my father had a lot of struggles together in their relationship. And I, and I started to see into the nature of the stress, the power struggle between my brother, my, you know, just my older brother, who was just a very beautiful man, very powerful and beautiful man. And my father was actually very resistant. To, to anybody else's power in the family, but, but ours, this, these are old times. These are strange times. And people didn't have the wisdom that they have nowadays about such things. But I tuned into the fact that my brother had some spiritual and some emotional and some deeply troubling mental issues as well in his relationship with my dad and stuff. So, I mean, we, we went through a lot of that. And I learned and I opened up from that perspective. And, and I just started working more at learning about the human experience, learning about emotion, learning about the connection between the physical body, the mind, the spirit, the soul, and just and not wanting to stop. I mean, it's not my nature to stop. I just kept digging and digging and learning and growing and, and evolving. And I just wanted to keep going with it. And I've, I've done that in my whole life. So I feel like when you, when you move into the quantum context of things, you're moving into the most expansive and the deepest level of possibilities. You're, mm -hmm. talking, you're, working, in the realm of, you're working in the realm of limitlessness. And that's exactly what appealed to me at that time and, and still today. You know, the idea that, that there's a part of us that's, that's limited, that's material, that's ego-based. There's a part of us that's limitless. It's soul-based, it's source-oriented, and it has no, no limitations by time, space, or circumstances. circumstances. So I think that I, I have been, been drawn to that. And then the work that I do with all my patients, the work that I've been doing for the past 37 years, that's been the focal point of it. It's just no, no limitations. And I think that that's really helped me in a lot of ways to, to tap into the realm of miracle possibilities and to, and to inspire people to actually engage in that process. Mm. You know, I think about some of the scientific research that's been done. Um, and, and these days, we, I mean, we've got a long ways to go, but scientists are able to evaluate the, the biofield, the energy field around a, a, a yes. person's body. They know that, yes, there's a biochemical reaction within the body that, that creates the healing, but it begins beyond the edges of the body. And so if we can learn to tune into that quantum field, and if we can learn to affect the quantum field, either from within or without, then it, um, it can transform our physical bodies and, and therefore our lives. So it's, I mean, it, it, it sounds woo in a way, you know, when you talk about spiritual, or whatever, but it's, it's scientific. And it I makes mean, perfect sense to me that you're dealing with both realms. I mean, there, there, was a, there was a researcher from Scotland. His name is Rutger Weaver. This is back in the early 1980s. He did some interesting studies of the, of the human body at an electromagnetic level. And he, and he discovered through a series of research studies that he, that he put together that the human body puts out 0 0.225 volts of direct current. So we have, we, we have literally have a biofield. I mean, this, we're, not, we're not talking about a... a a simulation or anything like that. We're talking about real, right. honest goodness, biochemistry that, that's, that has a chem, that has a, an electrical chemistry to it as well. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you can't, you can't possibly do justice 
to your healing process. You can't do justice to your growing and, 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 and evolving process in, in these areas unless you really tap into the, the fact that we are made up of cells that are electromagnetic and we produce energy in all the different visceral systems in our body and all the cells in our body and all the atoms in our body. So there's, there's each level has some reference to so to electromagnetic properties. So we, we are, we, you know, we are electromagnetic beings, no question about it. Yeah. And I love the fact that, um, that scientists have discovered that each cell has a sort of a toroidal, you know, magnetism yes, yes. around it, just yes. like the earth does and, and our entire bodies do as well. So it's, we're, we're catching up, but for those people who are hoping for a miracle, for those people who need healing, it really doesn't matter whether something has been scientifically proven or not. What really matters is, does an approach affect change within them or within a, a loved one? Can you share with our, our viewers and listeners a little bit about what you've seen and we're going to get more into de details about the approach that you take, but what you've seen in your practice. Well, I mean, I, I've virtually seen everything. I'm mean, literally, I mean, I've seen 60,000 patients over 37 years and I've seen, I've had so many terminally ill patients. I mean, I, I can use an example of something I just saw this morning, actually. I just saw somebody this morning who had a, a proclivity toward viruses, toward different viruses in the mouth, you know, fever, fever blisters and that kind of thing, retroviruses. And she had a virus that actually went in, went under a tooth, went under a tooth and caused an infl a viral inflammation under her tooth to the extent that it actually infected the, 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 the root of the tooth with, with this ret retrovirus, this inflammatory retrovirus. And at first they thought it was just like a root canal situation, a bacteria or something like that. And they didn't realize that it was a virus. And it wasn't until they put her on antivirals that she responded. But I mean, I just think that we're, we're, we're all seeing things. And again, her, her, her physicians and her dental people said this, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've never seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. So there's things that, are, that we're learning every day, but there's no limits. The, the part of the reason why we have to be driven to be limitless in our, in our treatises and in our approaches is because the world and the universe are limitless. And they present us with issues and problems that if we're gonna, if we're gonna solve them, if we're gonna rectify them, if we're gonna correct them and heal them, we need to be good enough to, to be all inclusive as well, because mm -hmm. disease doesn't stop anywhere. It doesn't stop anywhere. You got to be really good. You got to be really tuned in. You have to be um, intuitive. You have to be innately tuned into everything. And I think you got to be clear about the fact that there's no limit to, to the possibilities when it comes to disease or disease. We have to be as, as good, equally as good from the standpoint of, of cancer and, and, and fixing people's imbalances. So I'm curious about your perspective about um, if. Is there a difference between healing something like late stage cancer versus um, an infected tooth? Um, or, I mean, is there a spectrum? Because I think from the medical perspective, one thing is like impossible to heal or maybe impossible to heal without a lot of toxicity or maybe totally impossible to heal. But on the other realm, um, it, it could be perhaps not as difficult to, I mean, it, it could be as easy to heal as an infected tooth. What's your perspective on um, like severity of disease and the ability to heal? I, 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 first of all, approach every patient in the same, same perspective. I approach them all the same way. There's no limit in my mind to what our capabilities are. That's where I start. I start from that, that place of saying, look at as we said earlier, you know, there's more to the human experience than, than we often think about. There's a soul, there's a source, there's a spirit. There are parts that we can't see, obviously, and parts that are very powerful. And I think that the key is we have to be willing to implement all that, to, 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 to focus on the entire beingness that we have gifts for, that we've been gifted with, I should say, as we focus on trying to help somebody. And, then, and it, it begins, the, the, the limitlessness begins with compassion. I think you have to be you have to be clear about the fact that there's no limit to your compassion. You open up to your compassion. You care. You 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 love the soul that you're working with, and you respect them as being a soul that has a beautiful life experience, and and it's really vital for you to tap into that that in, that life experience and to, and to help help move it into a sense of balance, a greater sense of balance. 
So it doesn't matter what the disease is. Doesn't I don't focus on the disease, I focus on the patient. I don't focus on the disease, I focus on the, 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 the harmony, the, the correction, the, the rebalancing, the elements that are necessary to put them back in harmony. So can you tell us a little bit about your approach um, when you work with a, a client? Sure. I start off with a Q&A. We just, we talk, tap into what they got going on. They often bring their, their blood work in and they have a file pretty well filled up before we get started. And I check that all out. And we spend time tapping into nutrition, what their, what their, their history is for, for diet and nutrition. We tap into their emotional states. Their, their families, their loved ones, their, their, their work associates, the people in their life, and the kind of relationships they have with them. And then do they, are they fulfilling? Are they, are they loving? Are they, are they, do they feed your soul? Do they really, do they really make your life special? And, and are you really able to return and reciprocate that kind of energy? Um, so we tap into a lot of that. We tap into a lot of energy work we do too. We do, as we said, muscle testing. It's a system that I developed. And there's seven books that I've written. One of my books is called the, um, which one is the one with the muscle test? Yeah, Whole Health, is, that's probably the best one to recommend. There's, there's, there's several books that, that I've written have muscle testing, but Whole Health is the one that has the most comprehensive systematic procedure in there. So Whole Health is a book that actually talks in detail about my, my muscle testing system, but we can actually tap into vital organs and glands. The energetic properties of kidney, liver, gallbladder, heart, small intestine, large intestine, all that. We check everything out and we tap into the energy properties of each system. And we, we, th we check out the energy field between a, between a one and a 10. There's a plus one to 10 and a minus one to 10. So if somebody has a negative energetic property for a gallbladder or whatever. Is it minus one? Is it real? Is it just slightly bad or is it minus 10? Is it really severely de de depleted? So we measure that energy one to 10 minus and plus. Plus is obviously good. So plus 10 is the highest you can get, minus 10 is the worst you can get. We actually tap into the energetic properties of glands and organs. We also check their foods. We do a complete comprehensive muscle test energetically to all the foods, 100 some odd foods we check. And then we put together a plan, a game plan with nutrition uh, that actually is attuned to them bioenergetically. So the things that they passed energetically, the things they get. You can also pulse the food. So we have what's called pass fail testing. So we just get the arm up, we check kinesiology. Plus and minus. If, if something like wheat isn't a good food for them, and the arm gets down and they get weak. If we get a positive response with something, we hold it up and we, we can measure it plus and minus one to 10. So if the wheat is bad, how bad is it? Minus one, two, three, minus four, minus five. What is it? Minus 10 is really severe, like I said. Is it plus? So if your foods are plus seven or higher, that's a really powerful food. That's a very superb food for you energetically. And I contend that one of the most important therapeutic uh, rationales for our, for our success is that we take the time to pulse the food. So if you have somebody who's really sick with some condition that's really horrible, we can actually check their food possibilities from one to 10 and, and put them on a diet that's, if, if something's a plus one to five, it's not strong enough. I'll put them on plus five to 10 only. So those foods that pulse five or higher, those are the foods you eat for the next two weeks, three weeks, whatever. And we start them off with a, with a really clear, uh, scenario where they're, they're just basically eating the highest energetic supportive foods that we can find for them. We do all that energy work and we also do a lot of um, supplement work as well. So we tap into which, which supplements are good. We, we, we tap into different vitamins, minerals, homeopathic medicine, herbs, things like that. And we check them out for dose, frequency, and duration. So dose, two a day. Frequency, three days a week. Duration, six months, whatever the case may be. So we break it down very detailed from dose, frequency, duration. So we get your foods, your supplements all broken down, clarified in great energetic detail. It's, it's so powerful that it really helps so many people. It's really worked beautifully. So I think the, the basis of all this is you're, you're saying that people have an innate intelligence within their body or body, mind, spirit. And so you're able to help them tap into that to determine what's best for their bodies, what's best Absolutely. for their healing. Absolutely and, true. And I think that most people think in terms of one size fits all, like, oh, it's this type of cancer. And, and these are the foods you stay away from. And, and this is the food you eat. And so what you're saying is one size does not fit all. You're absolutely 100% right. And that's the most important aspect to our, to our program that 
we're dealing with so many people from so many different walks of life, so many different pasts, and so many different emotional contentions, and so many different uh, physical illnesses. And again, just do we just checking just checking out the organ systems when we do? One person has a liver that's a plus ten, another person has a liver that's a minus ten, and that's that's such a radical shift. So we we take the time to to re, to, to identify first, and then respect the nature of that the, the nature of their energetic properties, and everything proceeds from there. So you're absolutely 100% right. We have to take the time to individualize and to deal with people for, for, the, for the, the energy properties that they have and for the persons that they are. Mm-hmm. So you, you talk a lot about the emotional component as well. How are you able to uh, assess that in a way that can help people to make whatever changes they need to make in their life to support health? Well, we actually we do much of the same kind of thing with the energy testing. We actually test. Um, you know, and we, we we're sort of rooted in, in CCM, classical Chinese medicine. That's that's you know the, the original energy medicines that were so that were so predominant on the planet for for decade, for millennia, I should say, for mm-hmm. millennia. Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicines. We we focus on Chinese medicine, and there are five emotional uh, types, if you will, and there are three negative emotional types. So we tap into which which is the negative. There's anger, fear, sadness. And so, which of these and which of these energies, and to what extent are these energies, in, involved in this person's disharmony or imbalance? So it might be anger, anger minus ten, minus eight, something like that. We have to work with anger. We work with things like Bach flower remedies, which I love. Bach flower remedies are wonderful remedies for emotions. We use classic homeopathics, things like aconite for anxiety, stuff like that. So we use energy medicines and we use floral um, Bach flower medicines as well. But we tap in, we energetically tap in, and we diagnostically. Uh, attune ourselves to wherever the wherever the dis- disparities are, and try to bring them back into some semblance of that. And the beautiful part about it is, each time the patient comes back for a follow up, we get to recheck it, retest it. So is is the liver better? Is did it go from minus ten to a plus two or whatever? Whatever. So we can actually measure progress, and that usually that correlates with, with the patient's re- response. And how are you feeling? I'm feeling much better. I can sleep better. Whatever the case may be. So mm-hmm. it's really special. Yeah. And one of the things that I've learned both through my own personal journey, as well as um, that of many clients is when people are being brought back into balance, that it automatically has an effect in in other areas besides health in their life. They might let go of, of unhealthy relationships or shift their career from something that they feel is just a drudgery to something that inspires them. Um, And so it's, I mean, it it sounds to me like you're focusing on bringing people back into balance. And that means so much more than just the physical healing, doesn't it? It does. I think that the key is is that by by dealing with the whole patient in body, mind, spirit, you're actually opening the door to possibility for transformation, not not just not just doctoring. I say it goes from doctoring to healing to transformation. That's that's what I that's what I think. I think Mm -hmm. to take somebody from doctoring to healing to transformation. Is a beautiful process, and it's, and it's all open. It opens up to us when we take the time to tap into the wholeness of the person, and to, mm. to evaluate them energetically in the subtlest of ways, in body, mind, and spirit. So, um, one of the things that has been controversial over the last ten or fifteen years has been about um, if somebody is has something that's out of balance that relates to emotions, relates to life choices, that has helped create the disease. Um, there have been a lot of people who say, oh, you, that's blaming, that's shaming. I think it's empowering. What's your perspective on um, this concept of responsibility for patients uh, and, and clients in terms of um, having created the disease? Well, I think one of, the most empower- one of the most empowering parts of this process of healing, of transforming, is to understand that power is essential for the concept of healing, transforming. Whereas force tends to take over when it comes to to illness, disease, and sickness. So I think that we're either operating on a systems of power or force. And to take the time to realize that by blaming anything or anybody, we're immediately surrendering power and we're moving into the realm of force. We're opening the door for force to take us apart, to knock us down a few notches. And so I think that that boils down to the ease and the disease component. 
And I think that force creates disease and disease creates force. I think power is all about flow. And I think that flow is all about power. And that's, that's the key. And I think that when people take the time to, to recognize that they're blaming of whatever, blaming of whomever, is actually weakening their position as far as transformation and healing. Mm. So what about those people who just feel like victims? Because there are plenty of people who have any kind of, have some sort of physical issue, you know, whether it's advanced cancer or, or GI distress, and they, they blame the genetics or they, they're just thinking, I'm a victim of my genetics or I'm a victim of, you know, God, or I'm a victim of, I don't know what, it just happened to me. How does that fit into the model? I think you have to decide, first of all, what you want. And I think as a, as a, as a person who's of ill health, you're, you're many things, but you're, you are certainly a consumer. When you go to somebody to be m massaged or, or acupunctured or nutritionalized, you're, you're a consumer. And you have to decide what you want, what you're, what you're looking to get, what you're looking to purchase, what you're looking to end up with. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, if you are not clear about that, then it's not going to end good for you. I just think that you have to be clear about the fact that if you want to heal and transform, you need to, you need to consciously make that decision. But I, I'm determined to heal and transform. And to do that, it becomes really important for you to accept full responsibility for the process and to empower yourself, as I said a minute ago, to, to the recovery process, to the transformation process, and, and to not be limited by your own emotions, not be limited by circumstances, not be limited by conditions. There's a great line by the great author, Stephen Covey, that I always embrace about that stuff. He, Stephen Covey always said, it's not about conditions, it's about decisions. Mm, yes, that's so important. Yeah, I, I think about you know decades ago when I was experiencing the early stages of lymphoma and doctors said, we're gonna wait and watch until it gets to be bad enough and we'll put you on chemo basically for the rest of your life kind of thing. But Anyway, I was, I was doing meditation. I changed my diet. I was, I was taking multiple approaches and um, I was working on my doctoral dissertation in mathematical statistics. And somebody asked me, are you gonna finish your dissertation? And I was this close to being done. And, and I said, I'm gonna finish it if it kills me. And I heard what I said and I realized that um, it was killing me. And so I made this tough choice to leave the doctoral program. And I also moved across the country. And within three weeks, all the cancerous lesions disappeared. So it was the, sometimes those the taking responsibility has really, really big ramifications in our life. Um, you know, some people have to leave marriages. Some people have to make huge changes within the context of their situational life in order to heal. And that kind of responsibility is um, sometimes pretty tough to swallow. It can be daunting, no question about it. But I think I think you have to be willing. You have to be willing to tear everything down in order to build everything up. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a really important point. So it's basically devolution to to create a new kind of evolution within. Sure, sure, of course, because we, you know if you're not starting from the perspective foundation, you're not going to last. So it begins with it. It begins by by understanding the, the conceptualization of, of of grounding, rooting, foundational work. Mm -hmm. And I think see, you got to you got to clear the old foundation now. Just just gut it, and you have to be willing to gut the old foundation and let it let it let it let, it, let the chips fall where they may at that point, and then you start over again. And I think that's the only way that you can transform. You can't transform any other way. So I'm I'm kind of curious, Mark. Do you feel that um, some people have a part of their soul journey is to develop a disease? I think part of the soul journey is to have to contend with dis-ease. And I think by that, I mean that life, as Scott Peck said, you know, life is very difficult. And there's a lot of, a lot of pain and suffering, a lot of testing, a lot of confusion. I mean, this life can be like a fire drill sometimes. It's, it's pretty rough. It can be pretty dramatic. Yeah. And, and not, not just once in a while either. I mean, it can often be that way. It can be that way for extended periods of time as well. So I think that we're, that's a fact of life. That's, 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 that's the nature of life. That, that kind of chaos 
is the nature of life, that it's hard to accept the fact that even, with, even through the chaos, there's order. And, and the chaos is part of the order, ironically. That's the great paradox. But you have to understand that, that by contending with the chaos, with consciousness, you have the opportunity to build transformational strength that you never had before. Mm -hmm. The only way to build transformational strength that you never had before is to basically confront the chaos head on with as much positivity as you possibly can. And reconstruction begins right there. I love this concept of the, um, there is order to the chaos. What do you mean by that? Again, being, being a, a, a great student of CCM, classical Chinese medicine, I'm, I'm, I'm a Taoist. I'm very much into Taoism mm -hmm. and studied it for most of my life. And to me, Taoism is all about the fact that it's the idea that the Tai Chi circle sort of summarizes the, the, the reality of life. In the Tai Chi circle, the yin and yang signs, people call it, there's a dark semicircle and a light semicircle that, that are mutual compatibility of opposition that come together. Right. And for us to think in terms of just staying on the light side of the circle isn't living the whole life. We have to live in both circles. We have to live in the wholeness of, of the dark and the light. And you can't separate them. You know, it's kind of like the idea of, Separation is an illusion. Separation is the great illusion. I think everything is, is unified. I think un unification is the, is the classic uh, reality of all life. And I think it's really important for us to, to, to think about the, the, the mutual compatibility of opposition and to think about the fact that the greatest, the greatest potential for fullness is emptiness. And the more empty things are, the greater the capacity for them to, to be filled full and fulfilled. That the, there's the paradoxes. I think the paradox is a really yeah. important part of that duality. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And that emptiness can be disconcerting, uncomfortable, and yet it's it's a very empowering place to be. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I don't know if we're, we're really speaking the same language, but to me, that emptiness is that that place of that place where seeds can be planted to co-create something new it's where there you don't have that um how do i put this you don't have the structure there that determines the direction you've got this emptiness within which to create a new direction um what's your perspective on that yeah i mean i, I think we are speaking the same language i think that's it's right on the point i think that um we can approach emptiness one or two different ways, without consciousness or with consciousness, without faith or with faith, mm -hmm. without trust or with, with trust. So I think if we have trust, faith, and consciousness, we enter, enter into the void. We, 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 we are capable of that, with that in mind. We're capable of filling that void filled completely with, with, with totality, with everything, with unification, of full fruition. And I think that if we don't have faith, trust, in consciousness, we enter the void. We we take on a victim kind of con, victim pers personality there. I think that the the, right. the key is to have the conscious uh, trust and faith, and to know that we are here to fill that void. And we're here to complete the emptiness. It's to complete filling full the emptiness. But you mm -hmm. you don't have any emptiness to fill full if you, if you curse the void. So I mean, the void is is the answer. The void is the beginning. Yeah. And I think that. When, when I have patients and we work in these, in these areas, they, they catch on a lot quicker. I think when, when people are in desperate form, when people are really struggling with, with, with understanding their illness and understanding how to defeat their illness, understanding how to, how to work within the context of transformative healing, I think that they're much more receptive and they, they seem to get these words and they seem to get these concepts much better than, than when they're comfortable and when they're not fighting disease, so to speak. So one of the things that I've come to expect and, and to understand is that um, that place of surrender, that place of allowing is, is a very empowering place to be, which again, to me, seems like a, a paradox from the, the 3D realm of, you know, our, our um, human reality. How do you teach people to trust? How do you pe teach people to get into that flow particularly when they're experiencing something that's life-threatening and they've got a lot of fear? The only, way to, the only way to teach trust and overcome fear is surrender. I think to teach people surrender. I think to teach people 
that everything, including their life and every, every moment of their life, every aspect of their life, every breath they've ever taken, every heartbeat they've ever elicited, I think that we, we have to convey, convince them and convey the fact to them that it's all part of, of one organized, universal presentation. You know, our lives, you, you, no matter how unique our lives are, what, what parts of the world we live in, or how different we are, what our, what our belief systems are, anything. There's one universe. And we are, we're, we, don't, we, don't, we don't live in the universe. We are the universe. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important to tap into the fact that there's an organ, like I said a minute ago, even the chaos, in the chaos, there's order. The whole process is ordered. The whole process is sensible. The whole process is, 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 is in flow. It's in flow. So because we have will, we're the only thing in the universe that can actually antagonize ourselves by Im imposing our will. <laughs> You're saying that's a bad thing, huh? <laughs> oh, gosh. So <laughs> can you share um, some success stories of your clients? Because I think, I think that this sounds wonderful and and yet sometimes the concrete examples really drive it home to a person yeah. that yeah. this can work yeah i mean the film is really the film is the film is entitled the way of miracles as well so the book the book and the film have the same title they're there's they're slightly different i mean the book is different than the film it gets the book is more indulgent in spiritual spiritual um ex spiritual expansion i'd say mm -hmm. but the film the film's great it's got there's um six different patients in the film that actually tell the stories there was one woman in particular that had a, a brain tumor in her frontal lobe and her brain tumor was the size of a lemon and and she was told that she'd have to have that surgically removed and there's two ways they could do it they could either slice up under her nose or just just slice the center of her skull down the middle. So they, they, they went in through the skull, they cut open her skull, they removed the tumor, they got it all. But they, they closed her back up and two months later, the tumor returned to the same size. So she said, I'm not gonna go through that again. And there's just no way I'm gonna go through that, that hard procedure again. I can't do it, couldn't do it. So I'm gonna try to find some other way to, to make it happen. So she came to see me and I did extensive work on it. And we tested everything off. There's the, one, of the, one of the forms of testing that I have is called pain point testing. You go to the, wherever the body's in pain, wherever the body has a problem, you go to that point and you ask questions of the, of the nervous system through that pain, pain point. So I went to the frontal lobe, right where, right where the tumor was, put a light pressure, left hand on that, on that tumor point. And I asked a series of energetic questions and I checked our arm strength, the muscle strength. I'd say things like, how about wheat, arm would fail. How about sugar, the arm would fail, whatever the case may be. So we went through a bunch of foods, went through a series of medicine, natural medicines, all the above. I even tapped into the diagnostic component. I said, what is the major trigger for this? What is the major causal trigger for this tumor? What caused this tumor? Is it sugar? Is it wheat? Whatever. And I, we, we detailed the whole thing in, in perfect um, detail. And, and so lo and behold, I put on a program after we scored everything up, put on a program. And in five months, the tumor was completely gone. 100% gone. She went back to her, her oncologist and they said, we don't understand this. But you better just keep doing what this guy tells you. It's interesting because um, in my previous career, many, many years ago, I was a research statistician and um, I worked in um, cancer research and I was the head statistician on the brain tumor committee. Which, and so I'm very familiar with brain tumors and, and brain cancers. And it's it's much more difficult to deal with than some of the other cancers, such as colon cancer, and from the, the um, conventional medical perspective. Yes, and indeed. so to hear about a brain tumor disappearing, I mean, to me, that is just, that illuminates that there's, there was something really important going on that you were able to help her to redirect her life to that healing. That's a huge healing. I mean, when I, when I work with people, when I worked with her, I have such... I can't put it into words, but I have such a positive feeling about it. I have such a strong positivity. There's just nothing, there's, there's not an iota of doubt or negativity, not an iota. Mm -hmm. So I expect it. I expect it to happen. I expect it to, to work the right, the way we're trying to make it work. And I, and I convey that to the patient. 
And I figure if we both play ping pong with, with expectations like that, it can't be a bad thing. It never has been. So what is the power of expectation? Well, from, we talk about miracles. There's, I talked in the book, there's four different components to, to miracles. We can reject them. We can accept them. We can expect them. Or we can create them. So I think if you're working in the first levels of, of rejecting and accepting, you, 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 didn't, you haven't gone far enough to, to make it happen. There's, 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 a, there's, a, there's two different components of self. Self has a very powerful soul source, deep self, powerful mind self, powerful emotional self, powerful spiritual self, all the stuff we can't see, the stuff that we can't see that makes us what we are, who we are has great power, has great power. And I think if we just tune that in to these healing scenarios, that we have a far greater chance of tapping into something that already, that's already happening. I think healing is, miracles are already happening. They're already, they're already happening. We, we have to go to where they are. It's yeah. not like you have, to, you have to push a button to make miracles happen. You have to, you have to go to the right place. Yeah. And I say, and if you go to the right place within yourself, you will tread upon the land of miracles. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, um, you know, I, I learned over the years, and I remind some people who are struggling sometimes about this, is the healing begins in the energy field. And so even if they're going into a doctor and seeing that, oh, the tumor has not shrunk in size or it's gone up or whatever, what they're experiencing in their physical bodies in the now is based on energy from a while ago. So where they are energetically now can actually be predicting their future healing. So people shouldn't be so disappointed in, in the now if they still have symptoms, if they still have signs, because the now, it's the energetics of the now that determines the future. Where they're at now doesn't necessarily mean that's where they're going to be going. That's, that's perfectly spoken. You're 100% right about that, in my opinion. That's, that's exactly how it works. And I think that, you know, the double slit experiment, Einstein's double slit experiment. I mean, you think about that, you think about quantum physics, the quantum concept. That's what I said earlier. Why do we, why do we, why do we approach this from the quantum perspective? Because that, that everything's wide open that way. Yeah. There's, there's no limit to what your potentials are. So the double slit experiment makes it clear that we can actually operate beyond time and space. At, at maybe even more so, there is no time and space. Yeah. So, so you're operating in a different field of possibilities. If you, if you eradicate time and space, you've eradicated the most powerful limitations that could possibly render your results as, as not, not, not happening. You know, I think you want to go into the place where, you, where your results are, are, have a limitless potential. You got you to omit time and space. And I think the double slit does that for us. So the quantum approach, the quantum mechanics gives us that, that permission to reach beyond the grasp yeah, and to and make miracles. And to me, that, that's the wave portion of it, right? The, there it's, it is. The, it's, it's the all these potentials, which already exist, if we can access them from the field um, right. as that, that wave of potential. Yeah, that's exactly yeah, right. I, I think you're absolutely right that way. So um, before we go any further, I, I don't want to run out of time and, and um, so I want to make sure people know how they can connect with you, how they can watch the movie, how they can access your books, and um, also about what you offer via distance and in person. Yes. Uh, see, people want to watch the film. Again, the title of the film is The Way of Miracles. And, and the, the, uh, you can do a quick little Google search on thewayofmiracles.com. Thewayofmiracles.com. That'll take you right to the film. So that, that's that. And then the book is being distributed by Beyond Words which is Simon and & Schuster. And you can actually obtain the book um, on the internet. Amazon, yeah, Amazon has the book, The Way of Miracles, same title. And my practice, is, as we said earlier, is, is in the south of Boston area. But I do non-local work all day long. I do, we do a lot of Zoom and a lot of telephone appointments. And people can contact, we go to markmancola.com, markmancola.com, simple. And it's the last name is spelled M I N C O L L A. That's right, two L's. Yes, Mark with a K and Nicola with two L's. Yeah, yeah. You know, a funny story when when I when I I first thought about our last name being an Italian name, and I thought it's got to mean something, you know. 
<laughs> I could never figure out what it meant. One of my sons actually years ago went to um, went to school in Rome for for two years, and he on the day before he left Italy to come back home, he said, "Dad, Dad, Dad, are you sitting down? I got to talk to you really quickly." And I said, "What's up?" He says, "I just had a, a big dinner with a bunch of relatives, like thirty people from the family in Sicily got together and had a big celebration dinner." And he said, "You know what they told me? Our, our name means in Sicilian, Nincola means." Putting oneself back together, making oneself whole. Oh, I love that. I just could not believe that story. That just absolutely blew me away completely. So when people work with you, um, how, how long does it typically take? You know, is it, is it over weeks, months, years? Well, we do an hour appointment. The first, the first intake is an hour. You do all your muscle work, you know, all your energy work, find out what's going on with your glands and organs and food sensitivities and all that stuff, natural medicines, whatever. We do that comprehensively. Then we do a follow-up that's 30 minutes. Our follow-ups are 30 minutes. We've done our follow-ups before, but for the most part, it's an hour intake and 30 minute follow-ups. Mm -hmm. And we usually do those at about a month interval or so. And we can, but depending on the patient, what they're dealing with. Some of them, it's, people are doing well, three months. Yeah, that's, that's great, and that that's uh, that's a lot less than some of the the, the doctors that you're supposed to see um, in order to come back into balance. So it's uh, yeah, that that seems quite reasonable. So I know that a lot of people are they've got a lot of fear about the health situation in our world. In terms of supporting a person's immune system. Do you do consultations about that as well? Well, again, what we, we, we do is we teach people, we, we, we go through our system. We teach them about what's going on with their imbalances. Mm -hmm. So we get them clear about the fact that there's certain things they need to focus on to be back in harmonious balance. And that's different for everybody. Like you said earlier, it's not one size fits all. Right. We, we, we tap into it and we teach them about where their balances are, imbalances are, I should say. And we teach them how to, how to put those back into potential balance, how to work at it, what their, what their homework assignments are, what they can do to make that happen. Then we, re, we check up on them very soft and make sure they're headed in that direction. But as far as immunity goes, and that's the central part of the, of, the, of the equation, you know, I think that people, we teach people how to prevent as well as how to treat. And in order to prevent, you have to have the immune system peaked out at some potential level of, of sure. deficiency. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I've got great respect for naturopathy. I, my primary yeah. care physician is a, a naturopath, um, but there have been times when um, she has recommended certain supplements and I'll go to take it. And it's like, wait a minute, this doesn't feel right. Um, and I've learned to kind of navigate on an intuitive level but it, it sounds really fascinating to me to have somebody who can help direct you based on the muscle testing and, and its relationship to your organs as well as to the supplements in order to create peak health. So uh, yeah, this, this, this sounds fascinating to me. The amazing thing about it too, the body is absolutely dying to talk to you. It's, it's mm -hmm. your, your, your body, your nervous system, your energy field is dying to, to talk to somebody. It's dying to have a conversation. So whenever I, I tap in and start talking to people's bodies and energy fields, they can't wait to talk to me. They're so they're so ecstatic about getting the information that they get and about tapping in and about it, sharing. It's like they, they haven't been talked to. They, they've been ignored for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And to have somebody finally talk to them and to make them the priority of conversation is just astounding. The amount of energy that flies through people's bodies is astounding. Yeah, that, that gave me chills. Uh, you know, my, my, my truth meter was like going ding, 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 ding. Yes, you know. Um, and I think about how we do get disconnected from our bodies. It's almost like in our culture, at least, we're like this mind that's just on top of this body that, you know, can experience pleasure and, and, and get us from point A to point B. But we tend to be kind of disconnected. Uh, uh, yeah, we sure are. Are there, are, are there approaches we could take as parents or grandparents to teach children to continually have a conversation with their bodies? I think we need to not talk them out of it. 
Oh yeah. So, I think say more. We, yeah. I think I think when we start, we're very much tuned in with things that we that we we have sort of leached out of us. You know, we have things that are that are altered that are part of our natural constitution, and kids are constitutionally tuned into things that are so incredibly intuitive, so incredibly creative, and so incredibly spont spontaneous that we we often get disturbed by it as adults. I mean, we we sort of we, we sort of work it out of them, you know. And that's, I think we need to leave them, leave them alone more of the time. And I think we need to celebrate them and their nature and their, their beautiful instincts. And I think that we need to take the time to, to not be impatient with them because we have something busy to do that day. And I, I think about um, some of the parenting I've seen about just th this concept of you have to finish all the food on your plate. I mean, that message indicates that that child doesn't have an innate sense into when they've had enough. Um, and it's, it's the structure is imposed. Like you eat these foods and you eat at these times and you eat this much um, or you're going to go to bed hungry. I mean, it's just like there, there's, there are all these restrictions around foods and that in and of itself creates this disconnect with our bodies. Yeah. I got another one too. I, I never got it. I never liked, don't be silly. I think that needs to change over to be silly. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and I think that as In fact, we maybe you could teach balance, me how to be silly again, you know? Yes, yes. And I think that when we come back into balance and we, we get into that flow state, um, we become more lighthearted. And it's not that we're not processing the deep, dark feelings or, you know, whatever it is, the heaviness of life, but it has that balance, you know? Um, and, it, and if we can learn to laugh at ourselves, you know, that's like some of the best silliness we can have. We don't have to be guilty about being silly. Yeah, yeah, I love that, yes. So do you have um, a message for people who are out there suffering because they're, they're stuck in, in illness, a chronic illness, or they're afraid because they're experiencing um, a, a difficult diagnosis? Yes, go to a mirror, go to the nearest mirror you can find and take 10 minutes of your day to look into the core of your eyes in that mirror. So you look from eye to eye in that mirror and you just look deeply into your eyes, into your own eyes and take the time to feel your presence, just your presence, not, not, your, not the color of the shirt that you're wearing or the, the, the style of the hair that you've got, but to take the time to look into the eyes and to feel the presence of your being, to feel the, the essence, the energy, just the pure energy, the soul, the source, and to just feel, feel the frequency of that beautiful source and to know that that's the place where your miracles are authored, knowing that that's the place where limitless potential exists and waits for you. And to know that that's the, the important place for you to tap in and to unify and to connect with your deeper self in a way that you can then do the most important thing of all, which is after you've looked in that mirror for 10 minutes, now you're not looking at yourself anymore. You're going to go into that self, that source. You're going to become that source. So first of all, you, you see the source, then you become it. And by becoming the presence that is your source, becoming the energy that you are, you become a soul, you become limitless, you become miracle making. That's, that's the most important message I can give you. I love that, Mark. That, that is so empowering. And one of the things that I discovered when I was facing cancer, you know, decades ago, so when I looked in the mirror and I tried using some affirmations, I would see how disconnected I was with my own presence, how um, shame-filled and, um, you know, disempowered I felt looking at myself. So that the looking at ourselves in the mirrors can not only illuminate the the, the power within that presence that you're talking about, but it can also illuminate how we're stuck and the, these beliefs that we buy into that keep us disconnected from that power and presence. It'll dissolve, it'll dissolve the lie. Oh, oh, I love that. I love that. Boy, yeah, that's, that's great. Mark, um, again, the website is Mark Mincola, M-I-N-C-O-L-L-A.com. Um, sounds like you 
will help guide people from all over the world. And you've got an amazing history of helping tens of thousands of people. And I want to thank you for getting your message out in your new film, in your many books, and for being here today and sharing your message with our listeners. Thank you, Christine, for actually putting such a beautiful presentation on the air so that people can grow and evolve oh. and gain wisdom and faith. And thank you all who are watching and listening. Um, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much for tuning in today. If you'd like to empower yourself to step further into your vibration of change, please visit my website at christineupchurch.com where you can learn more about my insights, upcoming events, and private sessions.